Among the places he has served is a place called Pioneer Gardens. Uh, and I sense that there's a theme going on here, uh, which I want to speak about a bit. I, I am just so, so grateful to be here today. I'm especially grateful to not have to follow Barbara Bush, because uh, she killed it the other day. She was awesome. <laughs> But as I think all of you heard, the former First Lady spoke so movingly about service, so movingly about her family, but particularly what caught my ear was when she spoke about the simple work of planting peonies in Kennebunkport and the patience that's required when you plant those flowers and know that in that first year they may not bloom, but have a certain measure of faith that the, the work of seeding and planting them will indeed pay off. I want to pick up where Barbara Bush left off. When we think about civic life in America, when we think about life in general, we often speak a language of machines. We think about our economy as a big cogs and gears machines that's either stalling or picking up steam and needs to get kicked in gear. We think about our communities in terms of the way things fit together or don't fit together, like in a machine. We think about our relationship to government oftentimes as the relationship of a frustrated consumer kicking a vending machine. We think about civic life not only in a city like Chicago, but wherever you may be, in terms of political machines. That language and that metaphor surrounds and suffuses everything we do as citizens. But that idea that we are parts of a machine just isn't right. What we are, what we do in civic life, what we are part of, is a garden, not a machine. And the garden of civic life in this great democracy is not something that automatically runs itself any more than a garden out in the field actually tends itself. Tending that garden of democracy requires weeding. It requires seeding. It requires feeding. It requires careful, passionate, patient cultivation. And that spirit of gardening, of tending to our communities and our civic life, is something that everybody in this room does, but perhaps not all of us name. In the work that I've had the great blessing to be able to do, teaching and organizing and speaking and writing about how to cultivate great citizens, I've learned three simple things, three simple principles of great civic gardening, and I just wanted to share them with you this morning. The first one is this, true self-interest is mutual interest. Now just sit with that for a moment. I think in American life, as Wendy Spencer was saying, we sometimes tip a little too much toward rampant, raw individualism. Every man or woman for himself. And we believe in this idea that the way to be American is just to look out for yourself. Indeed, a lot of the ways that people outside this room think and talk about volunteerism and service is they describe it in terms of altruism, charity. But I would submit to you, and I believe everybody in this hall knows well, that volunteerism and service are not merely about altruism and doing good. That anybody who tutors a young child, anybody who works with a veteran who's returned home, anybody who cares for an elderly grandmother who needs help getting across town, anybody who helps an immigrant or a refugee navigate this new land knows that when we do this work of service, we bless and we benefit ourselves as much as anybody else. We feed ourselves as much as we feed those around us. That when we serve this way, we work in a spirit of mutuality. That volunteerism is not charity. It is indeed, as Tocqueville once said, self-interest 
properly understood. That all of us, when we volunteer and we serve, we become healthier, we become happier, we become more purposeful in our lives. And we recognize that a life worth living is not lived in isolation. It's lived when we are woven together in this fabric of mutuality. It is found and made purposeful by serving together. This brings me to the second principle that I've learned in the course of thinking about the gardens of our democracy, and that is this. We're all better off when we're all better off. Now, this may sound like some kind of word game, but it's not. It's a very simple principle. Even in this day and age where there is such severe inequality in the United States and so much privation in so many corners and quarters of our community, we have to recognize and remember that our fates are entwined so deeply that there is no way to cabin off my happiness from someone else's suffering. That we are again woven together. When we think of ourselves this way and remember that we're all better off when we're all better off, it changes just slightly the way we think about how we move in the world. And so then does the third idea that I want to share with you. The third idea is simply this. Society becomes how you behave. Now this too is a little bit contrary to the story that we often tell ourselves here in America. The story we often tell ourselves is one of, hey, I ought to be able to do whatever the heck I want as long as I'm not actively harming somebody else. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tread on me. But think for a moment what it would be like if society actually became how you behaved. Think for a moment about the power that's in your hands. There's a billboard I saw not too long ago by a very congested highway, and uh, it said this remarkable thing. It said, you're not stuck in traffic. You are traffic. <laughs> Which I think says it pretty much as succinctly as you can. We're not stuck in broken politics or dilapidated neighborhoods or mistrustful communities. We are these things by our actions and by our omissions. Our behaviors are contagious. Or to put it in more positive terms, when we choose to be courteous, say, in traffic, when we choose to be civil in our debates, when we choose to be compassionate in our citizenship, society becomes that much more courteous and civil and compassionate. True self-interest is mutual interest. We're all better off when we're all better off. And society becomes how you behave. These are the simple principles of what it means to garden our communities and our country. And I know I come from Seattle, and Seattle is a town of gardens. I know it's easy for me to say we've got big Olmstead parks and tiny little parking strip pea patches. I come from a city of gardens. But here's the thing. So do you. Every one of you here today comes from a city of gardens. I don't care how much blight or bounty surrounds you and your communities and your families. Every one of you has an opportunity today to begin tending, opening up, growing a great garden of citizenship and a great garden of democracy. And as we prepare to leave this great hall and go back out into the world, I simply invite you to do these simple things. Think like a gardener. Live like a citizen and pass it on.